Unfortunately, uh, uh, Professor Graham Hutchings was not able uh, to be with us today, but be sure not to miss his lecture, his invited lecture in Louisville at the 23rd NAM meeting. Um, Dr. Simon Freakley, who works closely with Graham, is kind enough to join us, and uh, we're thankful for that. Uh, let's see, Dr. Freakley, it's my understanding, will be sharing some of their work on hydrogen peroxide as it's related to catalysis by gold nanoparticles. synthesis of hydrogen peroxide from molecular hydrogen and oxygen. And this is done using gold palladium catalysts that can be prepared by a number of methods. I'm also going to talk about our recent work on the direct synthesis of hydrogen peroxide in a small scale flow reactor. So in 1989, while studying composite oxides for combustion catalysts, Professor Haruta discovered that gold nanoparticles could be active for CO oxidation at temperatures as low as minus 76 degrees C. Through data subsequently combined from the literature, it was shown that a relationship existed between gold particle size and the activity, where small gold particles were needed for high activity, as long as independent of the support used, we always needed a small gold particle for high activity. So gold on iron oxide prepared by co-precipitation was one of the catalysts first shown by Professor Haruta to be active in this reaction. And when prepared by co-precipitation, these catalysts show exceptional activity in CO oxidation, even at temperatures well below zero degrees C. Recent advances in STEM technology allowed a number of gold structures to be imaged on these catalysts. So at the time, in uh, 1993, the microscopy technology allowed the imaging of gold particles of around 2 to 3 nanometers on the surface of the titanium support. Recent advances through aberration correction have um, allowed the imaging of um, species of small atomic gold and sub-nanometer gold clusters to be seen on these catalysts. These catalysts, in fact, contain a wide variety of uh, gold species. This led to um, Professor Hutchings to start thinking about what would, could be the active site in these gold and iron oxide catalysts. <coughs> Prepared a number of catalysts by co-precipitation of iron nitrate and tetrachloric acid with sodium carbonate. These catalysts were then dried in different methods. The first catalyst was dried in flowing air at 120 degrees C for 16 hours, and this turned out to be an extremely active catalyst for CO oxidation. The second sample was dried in static air at the same time and at the same temperature, and this proved to be a very poor um, catalyst for CO oxidation. Through low magnification images, the catalysts looked very similar, indicating that the poor catalyst didn't have very, very large um, gold nanoparticles. On closer inspection, these catalysts were shown to contain a number of gold species. So, large gold nanoparticles, um, around 10 to 20 nanometers in size, assumed to be not contributing too much to the catalysis. It was shown to contain small gold nanoparticles around 1 to 10 nanometers in size, um, as originally shown by Professor Ruta. And we could also image gold, isolated gold atoms, small gold clusters, small than a nanometer, and these could also be split into monolayer and bilayer gold structures. So looking at both of these samples under the aberration corrected microscope in Lehigh, led by Professor Fitzpiley, we could see that atomic gold was present in both species indicated by the red circles. 
both catalysts were also shown to contain um, gold nanoparticles above one nanometer. However, the difference between the two catalysts was observed. The very active catalyst was shown to contain small sub-nanometer gold clusters. These clusters um, could be monolayers or bilayers. The monolayers were around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 nanometers in size, and the gold bilayers, which consist of around 8 to 10 gold atoms, were about half a nanometer in size. And these are only present in the very active catalyst. So following this, we took the very active catalyst and we exposed it to heat treatments to try and sinter the gold particles to see what effect this has on the activity and also what effect this has on the um, particle size distribution. So this is um, a particle size distribution derived from the microscopy data showing the very active catalyst calcined, calcined at various temperatures. As you can see, as we increase the calcination temperature, the activity of the catalyst decreases. 100% activity after an initial drying step to less than 1% activity after calcination in 600 C. So comparing these samples, we can see that as the calcination temperature is increased, the number of nanoparticles increases. This is due to sintering of the gold particles. You can also see that the number of monolayers present in the very active catalyst remains fairly constant through the calcination the number of atoms changes slightly during the procedure, but what we noticed was that the number of bilayer structures seemed to follow the activity of the catalyst, with the least active catalyst having the least amount of bilayers. So if we assumed that the bilayers were the active component of the catalyst, the UCL oxidation, we could calculate that these bilayers contributed around 0.3 weight percent of the gold from an initial total of around 5%. If we assume that all of the catalyst, all of the catalysis comes from these gold bilayers, we get a turnover frequency which is in very good agreement with the uh, model studies by uh, Wayne Goodman on um, monolayer and bilayer structures of gold. So this led us to propose that these small bilayer clusters could be the active spe gold species in CO oxidation. And this is work that is still carrying on today in collaboration with Professor Harita to try and, um, to try and definitely uh, prove this. So following the discovery in 1989 of Professor Harita <coughs> that gold could be active in CO oxidation, and also at the same time the prediction by Professor Harita Professor Hutching, sorry, that gold could be the best catalyst for acetylene hydrochlorination. This has led to, led to an explosion in the number of publications concerning catalysis by gold in the literature over the last decade. Included in these um, publications are a number of uh, um, publications where gold is used as a promoter or an alloy with other metals for more active catalysts. One, one such system is uh, one such system that has been extensively studied is gold palladium catalyst. It's one of the simplest ways of preparing a gold palladium catalyst is by a standard wet impregnation method. So to take the palladium chloride precursor with the gold precursor, dissolve in water, heat it up slightly to 80 degrees to ensure the palladium dissolves. Add your support, typically a titanium or silica or carbon. You then dry off the support to form a paste by evaporating the water out of the preparation. And then you calcine a high temperature in an oxygen environment. Now this preparation method, while being shown to produce um, gold palladium alloys, it's also been shown to produce a wide variety of particle sizes for gold and palladium. You can't control the particle size very well, as can be seen in the microscopy image of a number of very small gold palladium alloys and also some very large These catalysts um, can typically be used for reactions such as hydrogen peroxide synthesis, which I'll come to later. So if we take a closer look at the structure of these gold palladium alloys after um, the oxidative high temperature treatment, 
we can see that they're not homogeneous alloys. After just the drying step, we do observe homogeneous alloys, but these catalysts are very unstable in the aqueous conditions during the reaction. To impart stability into these catalysts, we need the high temperature heat treatment. So during this high temperature heat treatment, we can see an evolution in the structure of the gold palladium nanoparticles. What we see is that the gold is in the core of the particle, and the outer shell is made of palladium. So these catalysts can be used very effectively for hydrogen peroxide synthesis. Um, so here we can see um, a typical hydrogen peroxide synthesis reaction that we carry out in our lab. The palladium only catalyst shows um, an activity of around 31 moles per kilogram per hour. But it shows very poor selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide. Historically, palladium is the most studied catalyst for hydrogen peroxide synthesis due to its hydrogenation characteristics. However, to achieve high hydrogen peroxide concentration using a palladium catalyst, you need to add promoters such as acid and halide into the reaction mixture. We carry out our reactions in the presence of no promoters, <coughs> and we observed that the addition of gold into these palladium catalysts significantly boosted the activity towards hydrogen peroxide synthesis. This was done mainly by an increase in the selectivity towards hydrogen peroxide. So we see a small decrease in the amount of hydrogen conversion. Gold on its own um, produces a very small amount of hydrogen peroxide. So this is a true synergistic effect between gold and palladium in these catalysts. So I'll talk a little bit now about the direct synthesis of uh, hydrogen peroxide. So hydrogen peroxide synthesis is conceptually quite a simple reaction to hydrogen and oxygen. Um, around 2.2 million tons are made in, in industry every year. And around 40% of the hydrogen peroxide is used in the paper bleaching industry, where it leads to the pressure and they have to move away from the chloride-based um, bleaches. Another 40% of hydrogen peroxide produced each year is used in the chemical synthesis industry. This is due to hydrogen peroxide having a very high content of active oxygen. Also, the only byproduct of oxidation by hydrogen peroxide is water, which makes it a um, very attractive green oxidant used in chemical synthesis. Most applications um, that require this um, hydrogen peroxide typically need around 3 to 10 weight percent of hydrogen peroxide. So the current synthesis method for hydrogen peroxide anthroquinone process, which involves the sequential hydrogenation and oxidation of an alkyl anthroquinone. This process involves the hydrogenation using a nickel or palladium catalyst of the anthroquinone to the diol. The diol is then exposed to an air feed and then re-oxidizes and produces hydrogen peroxide as a byproduct. At the moment, around 95% of hydrogen peroxide is produced using this method. The advantages of this process are that you can operate at mild temperatures and you can avoid the dangerous um, contact of oxygen and hydrogen. The disadvantages of this process are it's only economical on a very large scale. Due to side reactions, the anthroquinone has to be con continuously replaced to keep the efficiency. Um, there's also a high cost associated with the requirement of separating the hydrogen peroxide from the organic medium. Um, Hydrogen peroxide produced by this method still needs to be concentrated up. So we can produce concentrations around 90% only after a further concentrating step. And this means that concentrated hydrogen peroxide still has to be transported from these plants to its end, end point of use, which is very dangerous. Typically at the end use, the hydrogen peroxide is then re-diluted back down. So the direct synthesis of hydrogen peroxide is not a very um, attractive alternative to this method. This would be a 100% atom efficient reaction, it would be more viable at small scales, and with no need to transport concentrated solutions of hydrogen peroxide if you could do on-site generation for your needs. The complications with this reaction are a number of side reactions. So hydrogen and oxygen can undergo combustion to form water, Hydrogen peroxide itself can be hydrogenated to water. 
And because hydrogen peroxide is not a particularly stable molecule, it can undergo decomposition which all affect your selectivity. These two reactions can be substantially catalyzed by the same catalyst that can um, catalyze the synthesis of hydrogen peroxide. And the challenge is to stop the reaction here. So one of the problems with using these gold plating catalysts for this reaction is that as well as having a very wide particle size distribution, as you can see here, from two to three nanometers, all the way up to plus 20 nanometers, as I showed earlier, we get a composition variation with size. These small particles tend to be very palladium rich. As we increase the particle size to 10 nanometers and 50 nanometers, the particles are seen to contain more gold and less palladium. So we have two competing effects. We have a particle size distribution and a composition distribution. This is thought to occur through an Oxford rifling mechanism where the gold is more low, mobile than the palladium. So the gold will leave the smaller particles and enter the bigger particles. To get around this, um, we recently published in ACS Nano a new preparation method which we have named our modified impregnation method. This is done using an excess of chloride anions. So we take our palladium chloride and our gold tetrachloroauric acid and our support. And instead of just using an aqueous medium, we use a dilute HCl. We then dry the catalyst off as before. And instead of using an oxidative heat treatment, we also now use a reductive heat treatment, and this helps to remove most of the chloride from the catalyst. So looking at um, particle size distributions and the particle composition distributions as a function of the concentration of chloride that we use in this preparation, we can see that um, when we follow this preparation without any HCl, we still get a wide particle size distribution. However, the composition distribution is now pretty much uniform, with around 80% palladium in all the particles. As we increase the HCl concentration, we tighten up the particle size distribution um, to a mean uh, particle size of around 3 nanometers. And we also change the composition of the catalyst. As we go to stronger HCl concentrations, we see a similar particle size distribution. And now we see very uh, gold-rich particles. So this preparation <coughs> method allows us to tighten up the particle size. And the concentration of HCl also allows us some control of the composition of the nanoparticles in the catalyst. So now we test these catalysts for hydrogen peroxide synthesis our modified impregnation against our typical everyday standard impregnation. So we're using a one weight percent metal loading. Um, from these results, this is a solid mobilized catalyst which goes through the same procedure for reductive heat treatment. This is our conventional impregnation and this is our modified impregnation. And I should stress we're using um, this catalyst here. It's a particle size of around three nanometers uh, roughly 50-50 um, gold to palladium ratio in the nanoparticles. So as you can see, we get a big increase in our hydrogen peroxide synthesis activity. So if we compare this low-loaded catalyst to our typical five-weight percent um, catalyst, we can see it's even better than our five-weight percent catalyst. It means we're using the gold and palladium much more effectively in this preparation method. Catalysts are also stable to multiple reaction cycles in the autoclave. So most of our work so far regarding these materials has been carried out in a autoclave in a batch um, system. And this, um, due to the long reaction times of 30, 40 minutes, um, you do have to consider all of the subsequent reactions, um, the hydrogenation, the decomposition. So what you're seeing is is the net amount of hydrogen peroxide left at the end. To investigate the reaction conditions in a much more controlled um, manner, we built a, a very small scale um, flow reactor to do the hydrogen peroxide synthesis in. So any reaction that can take away the uh, yield by subsequent reactions, using a flow system should help to control or at least understand it. So now we're passing our hydrogen and oxygen previous 
both diluted in CO2. This is one for the safety um, reason. Another benefit of using CO2 is that a small amount of CO2 will dissolve in the solvent, therefore acidifying the solvent slightly and stabilizing the peroxide which we make. We use water and methanol as our liquid feed. Um, we use the methanol to improve the solubility of the hydrogen, the oxygen, the, uh, the solvent. So we're using a very small scale reactor, a diameter of around an eighth of an inch, taking around 100 mg of catalyst at any one time. And we control the temperature in the water bath. We take liquid samples every hour. So a typical synthesis experiment um, that we carried out would be a 10 bar, 2 degrees C. We use the gas flow rate that we determined uh, previously at 42 mL per minute, a stoichiometric hydrogen and oxygen, 1 to 1. Um, importantly, we're not using any acid or halide promoters, so we do have to consider all the side reactions in this. So I'm just going to flip through some of the reaction <coughs> conditions that we um, explored. The concentrations of hydrogen peroxide we made are very low, but this is a very um, small-scale reactor, and we are studying the um, reaction conditions more than trying to achieve value. So as you can see, the, um, as we increase the pressure in the system, the um, concentration of hydrogen peroxide that we're making also increases when we need. Um, as we increase the pressure, the selectivity remains the same, but the conversion of hydrogen increases. This shows that the uh, synthesis and also the subsequent reactions are increasing the uh, proportion of the selectivity. We investigate the effect of temperature on the synthesis of hydrogen peroxide. <coughs> as we increase the temperature, concentration of hydrogen peroxide may decrease. We can also see an increase in conversion and a decrease in selectivity. This shows that um, as we increase the temperature, the subsequent reactions are starting to take effect. Um, also, as we increase the temperature, the oxygen solubility in the solvent is reduced. This will lead to a lower synthesis um, rate so as a hydrogen solubility um, a uh, higher hydrogen We looked at the effect of the solvent flow rate. So as we put more salt, solvent through per minute, we saw a increase in the concentration of hydrogen peroxide that we were making. Although if we calculated the number of moles we were making in one hour, we actually saw an increase in the number of moles with the solvent rate. So we thought this was quite interesting. So we measured the conversion and the selectivity. See, as the solvent flow rate increases, the number of moles of hydrogen peroxide also increases, while the conversion remains fairly steady. So the number of the increase in the moles of hydrogen peroxide must cause to an increase in the selectivity. And we explain this by saying that the more solvent in the system, the more shielded the hydrogen peroxide will be from the catalyst. So you're effectively diluting the hydrogen peroxide and slowing down the subsequent hydrogenation and decomposition. And this is a um, very high selectivity process. We also affect, investigated the effect of um, uh, as you can see, it's not natural the uh, activity that are quicker when you have a system. This is just due to an increase in the hydrogenation rate. So following all this, we try to convolute the synthesis of decomposition in the hydrogen. Thank you.
by the past type of rate constants. Um, we've got our rate constants into this equation, um, in the concentrations of the hydrogen and the oxygen that we use during the synthesis. And we can see that our calculated concentrations of hydrogen peroxide fit very nicely into the experiment. One further Yeah,